Welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast, your source for information on hunting, fishing, and all of your outdoor passions. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast. My name is Mike Anderson, and today we're joined by two special guests, Emily Shad and Nicole Stone, who are ambassadors for DSG, a line of women's clothing that's really taken off here at Shields. DSG stands for Do Something Great, which is exactly what Emily and Nicole portray with their outdoor adventures. If you're an Instagram user, chances are you've seen Emily with a massive buck she harvested last year named The Freak. And we'll be hearing all about that story, along with some insights on shed hunting, land management, her thoughts on DSG, and more. Then we have Nicole Stone, who specializes in the fishing side of things. We'll get to hear all about her recommendations on DSG gear for fishing, along with a bunch of tips and tricks on how she's been successful this past year, and what's exciting for both of these ladies coming up in the future. Let's kick things off with you, Emily. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm um, Emily Shad, and I am 28 and from Southeast Ohio. Um, a little bit about me, um, I pretty much grew up in a hunting family. My dad was actually a big game guide out west in Idaho for between 30 and 40 years, somewhere around there for elk and bear. So he would be gone at several months at a time, you know, out there guiding hunts. So I got to hear a lot of stories, see a lot of the animals, a lot of the photos. And our whole house was covered in animal mouths from elk, bear, turkey, deer. So, you know, there was no way that I wasn't going to grow up to be a bow hunter when my dad did all of that. So, you know, he took me on my first hunt when I was 12. I killed my first buck and then... The following spring, I killed my first turkey, and then I was pretty well hooked on hunting. Um, but gun hunting was never my thing. I always wanted to bow hunt. So at age 13, I worked all summer laying flooring with my dad to get enough money to buy my first compound. Um, so I bought my first compound when I was 13, and I have not picked up a gun for whitetails or anything um, ever since. So I've been shooting a compound strictly for 16 years now. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how, uh, where I got now. <laughs> that's very cool. And I see you're, uh, continuing the tradition of having mounts in the house with that gorgeous buck <laughs> in the background there. Yeah. I don't have a whole lot of room here. So all my mounts are in another place, but I do have the freak buck here. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I am, I am looking forward to hearing that story here coming up a little bit. So thank you for joining us today. And, uh, and yeah, thank you so. as well, Nicole, can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you developed a passion for the outdoors? Oh, yeah. So I currently live in North Dakota, grew up in central Minnesota, started fishing when I was about six years old. Um, my parents are farmers, so I was like a kid of a small town dairy farmer. All we did was hunt and fish really since as long as I can remember. Uh, and my parents introduced me to fishing. They actually took me out of kindergarten and introduced me to sucker fishing at a little local river, local river we lived by. And uh, it was kind of the introduction to fishing for me. And from there, I just, you know, we started fishing lakes as I got a little bit older and that kind of, we were never really great at it, but we loved to do it as a family and I love to do it. And um, the older I got, the better I got. And I really grew a passion for it. Once I met my husband, we really went hard for it. So what we did was we bought a boat, we started traveling all over the Midwest and Canada and just chased big fish and grew a passion ever since. That's very cool. And I have to say, I actually got started with fishing the same way, just like going to the river at my grandparents' place doing sucker fishing. You know, every every time we would go there, I just, as soon as I showed up, hey, can we, can we go fishing? Let's go catch some suckers. And I remember like, you know, putting them on a, finding a big stick and tossing them on there and using that as a, as a stringer. And it's just, you know, great memories and, uh, you know, just Cool to, cool to hear that story. So, um, you know, let's talk okay. about a little bit more recent stuff. Like, uh, you know, I've been, I've been snooping on your Instagram a little bit, seeing all your fishing photos. Can you, uh, <laughs> can you, can you tell us a little bit about how your season's been, what you've been up to? Oh yeah. It's been a great season so far. So, um, just like 
earlier last year, obviously COVID hit. So a lot of us ended up fishing locally. So I did a lot more fishing around central Minnesota, pan fishing, walleye fishing, a lot of smaller local bodies of water. But as things have opened up, you know, it's been trips to Red, trips to Leech, trips to Lake of the Wood, Rainy Lake, Cabotogama, anywhere there's a hot bite, I like to go there. Um, obviously, I'm getting ready to go to the Rainy River like everybody else right now. We're getting ready to go to Rainy River, you know, the Missouri or Green Bay. <laughs> and so that's kind of what, you know, the season has transpired to. Ice season was really, really good. Just like everybody, we hit it hard, you know, with the DSG girls on red when everyone – you know, there was a million people out there because there was ice, but the bite was awesome there early in the season. And then I've just been kind of beat bopping around from there. And it's been a great season, more anglers than I've ever seen before on the ice. So mm-hmm, it's good. Yeah. It's growing it's, fast. It's especially awesome. With the women. Yep. It's awesome to see all the anglers out there. And like you said, especially women, it's, it's super cool to see them just getting into the sport, trying new things and, and enjoying it. Yeah. So. It's been, it's been awesome. And I, yeah, a lot of new anglers. And I think that's kind of been exciting just to meet people out on the lakes and have people message on social media because they see a lot of us um, on DSG, both in hunting and fishing and, you know, killing it. And they just want to learn how to start and where to go. And yeah, I think we're seeing the sport growing to a whole new level. Yeah, that DSG platform has just been, it's been really cool to watch just the levels of engagement and the people asking questions and just the, the content you guys have been putting out. Like, like you mentioned that trip to Red. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What, uh, what that was all about? Yeah, so we got some of the DSG girls together uh, just to kind of run a little campaign and get people excited with some photos and a little video shoot and meet people out there. And it was an absolute hit. We just you know, red is one of those fisheries that obviously has an incredible number of walleye. So you're going to come out of there. It has a lot of fishing pressure, but it also just has a high density of fish. And, you know, those last couple of years, they're not those 16 inch walleye anymore. They're, you know, 20, 22. A lot of people were catching 25, 26 inch fish regularly. So that's great walleye fishing. And so when we were able to bring a bunch of us girls out there early in the season and really have some fun, I think when you share that across social media, it gets a lot of the other girls excited, not just for the gear, but like to find their girlfriends and go up there and catch fish. Cause it's not about being like the best angler. It's just about getting out and putting in the time and going to a body of water where, you know, you're going to have a good time and catch some fish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And red, red is a great lake for that. I, I actually hit it up early this year too. And we did, we did fairly well. What's nice about that fishery is like, they're aggressive. You know, like I'm yeah. using Tika minnows and, and ripping wraps and stuff like that. And like my local lakes around here, you throw one of those on and they're just like, I am out of here. But red, they just get angry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think like it really comes down to the competition level. I mean, it's just there's, you know, here we have super clear water lakes, not a high density of big fish to compete over food. Um, and there it's just the ridiculous number of walleye and just what they're eating. It's just creates a, an aggressive atmosphere and people love it. You know, it makes fishing fun for everyone where I am sure you and I are fishing some similar waters in central Minnesota. And it's like, you wait for that twilight bite and you have the smallest jig possible with live bait. And it's all about finesse where red, you can go, you know, you can use everything. You can use rip and wraps. So that yep. makes it fun. Go crazy. Use anything in the tackle box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that makes it great. For sure. Uh, so, Emily, going back to you, um, how uh, how's your past year been? I mean, I see a I see a giant buck on the back of the wall there. So, I mean, obviously, it's it went fairly well. But can you give us a little bit of a recap on uh, on what you've been up to? So, 2020 season. I mean, the whole year 2020 was bad for a lot of people. Um, but you know, for me, it was my best season when it comes to bow hunting, never had a season like it. So, you know, we started out with spring turkey season. I was able to harvest my first gobbler with the compound. And so that was a milestone that I've wanted to reach for so many years. And I was finally able to accomplish that, you know, found some of the biggest sheds I ever found, you know, before turkey season. And then once fall came around, Um, I went to Idaho for 16 days and completely off grid, no cell service, no running water, nothing, living in a tent for two weeks up in the mountains um, and did a lot of, you know, trout fishing, shot a lot of grouse with my bow. Um, The main point of the trip was elk hunting, but 
Um, the elk hunting didn't go as planned because of the wolves and stuff. They completely cleared out the whole unit that we were in. So, like, you never even heard any elk, never saw any elk. It was awful. And we got overridden with wolves. So that, you know, that was kind of crappy. But it ended up turning out really good because we were prepared to um, hunt for bear, too, because the unit that we were in has such a high population of bear that, you know, being in non-resident, we can get a reduced bear tag. It's really cheap. So I was actually able to harvest my most unique black bear with the bow. Um, he had a huge white triangle on the front of him that went clear down through his, his stomach. So he was just an incredible animal and I was able to harvest him with my bow. So that was a big milestone. I've always wanted to shoot a bear with my bow. And then I shot one of the most unique bear that I'll probably ever see. So um, that was really neat. And then coming back into fall, you know, getting prepared for bow season, you know, I had this, the buck here beside me, the freak buck, I had him on my mind, you know, from that spring from finding his shed. And, you know, I always had him in the back of my mind and I did everything in my power to try to maybe get a photo of him or, you know, to figure out what he was doing. But once bow season came around, you know, still no sightings of him. And then being able to finally put everything together, which we'll talk about in a little bit with that hunt, um, to be able to harvest the biggest buck of my life being 190 inch gross whitetail with my bow. I mean, it's always been a dream to shoot a, a Boone and Crockett whitetail, but for it to actually become a reality, it's just insane. So it's going to be really hard to top that one. So 2020 season was by far probably the best season I will ever have. And it'll be extremely hard to top it. <laughs> yeah, that, that is an incredible season. Um, I, I'd like to go back to the bear first. So, um, elk hunting, that is, that's a challenge. Is it, was it the first time you'd gone elk hunting? Yes, it was the first time it was all public land. Um, my dad had been out there the previous year and he had scouted and there was elk all over in that unit. So we kind of made arrangements for all of us to go back out there and pursue this unit again. Well, little did we know the wolves moved in and the elk moved out. So the, <laughs> about the only thing we had left was hearing wolves and seeing wolves and no elk at all. So yeah, it was really, really tough. Yeah, that's that's super frustrating and just nothing you can you can really control. You know, there's no, no, nope, not at all. But that's cool that you could uh, you could kind of call an audible and switch to uh, to bear hunting. So how do you, I imagine? What did you do? Spot and stock for it then? Because you can't like bait them or use use that sort of method. So how did you how did you go about uh, getting your bear? So um, with the bear hunting out there, like I said, there's so many of them. Um, in this unit to where in the honey, not the honeysuckle, the huckleberry um, crop was incredible. And, you know, bear love huckleberries. So you would go in a huckleberry patch and you get to see where bears have demolished it. So um, from dad's previous guiding and stuff, I mean, the best way to pursue a bear and stuff is to set up, especially in an area with a bunch of huckleberries and stuff is set up a ground blind and just sit and be patient and wait. And that's literally what we did. We set up a ground blind and then I went in and the bear were feeding in the, in the huckleberries. I actually had a smaller bear and stuff that I got a lot of video of. He was completely highly entertaining. Um, and then that big bear, he finally came in the second to the last night and I blew my opportunity because I could not, I was drawn back on him three or four different times and he would never just give me the right shot that I wanted. And then he actually heard me draw back the fourth time and took off. And, you know, bear are so, most people are so intimidated by black bear, but honestly, black bear is like a giant rodent and they are absolutely afraid of anything. If they even hear anything, they are completely gone. So I thought I completely blew my opportunity and I couldn't believe when he came back the very last hour of the last night of the trip and finally gave me a shot opportunity. That's, that's very cool. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't really blame a lot of people for, for being a little intimidated by bears though. You got like a 400 500 pound animal especially <laughs> at ground level and you just have a bow with you like that's yeah. got to be a pretty intense situation there it, it 
is like it took me a few i mean a few times to get used to it kind of when you have your first bear come in i mean your heart's pounding you know they're right in front of your on ground level and they sound just ferocious by how they they breathe and they're trying to smell you and stuff like that but really once you get to watching them they're honestly so entertaining it's hard not to laugh you know watching them do their thing and like i said they're scared of everything if they hear anything they're just on high alert at all times and if you make any amount of noise at all or if they get any you know wind of your scent i mean they're completely gone and they most of the time they do not come back so like i said i was really surprised when that older bear came back the next night Mm -hmm. very cool and it was i bet it was nice to have that uh that guide in your back pocket that's been that's been doing it for years and years yeah so you know my dad used to guide elk and bear hunts and stuff so and i had been out there um previous years in other areas and stuff and dad kind of showed me you know how things work and really kind of how to bear hunt and stuff so you know we kind of set up the ground blind in a spot and then he kind of just let me go on my own with things and figuring out things so you know it was helpful having some previous knowledge you know with bear hunting that way it wasn't like such a big ordeal to be out there by myself you know ground level with a black bear mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. That's, that's pretty sweet. So, um, I would love to hear a couple of your best stories now. Let's, uh, let's start with you, Nicole. What is your, what is your favorite story from your, from this past year? Or it can be, it can be a ways back too. Um, let me, I'm still thinking about that a little bit. <laughs> There's been so many, um, you know, I've been super fortunate because I think some of my favorite stories come from Manitoba, um, just because the fishing there is incredible. And I've been able to fish with some incredible people and on some incredible bodies of water. Uh, and I'd say some of the best trips have been, you know, vertical jigging for lake trout at Lake Athapaskow up there uh, in northern Manitoba or Wakusco Falls with Brian Bogdan. Um, had a lot of fun. Me and Anna did a segment there. And, you know, you're just sitting there and you're just catching walleye left and right. It's out of control. So I really love walleye fishing and I really love pan fishing. So those are probably two of my best memories from the year before that I really missed this year that if you asked me like out of this whole fishing experience what did I love the most it's definitely you know sitting out on the middle of a lake and just watching the end of your rod as these massive lakers are in 130 feet of depth you know just tapping it and then you just have to rip on the hook set because you know you got to get it through their mouth and you got to you know be able to hang on because they can run for it and the battles just went on and on and on it was like a dream um and then in this last year, we obviously didn't have that opportunity. And so me and Anna, who's kind of my little sidekick, we did a lot of pan fishing and we went to this little tiny pond uh, in central Minnesota that we had heard there was some big crappie. And we just sat out there for like two days, just seeing what we could catch. And we caught the crappie of our dreams and we just lost it. We just went into, we, uh, drilled around the basin cause we just wanted to see if like the weeds were alive and they weren't. So that kind of tells you move into the basin. So we kind of started punching holes till we started marking fish. And as soon as we saw where they were circling, we set up our hub and just went for it. And we're sitting in 40 feet and they come in suspended. And we had one come up, you know, a lot of times crappie, the biggest fish are the highest, they come in a lot higher. And, you know, I saw one come up high and she's like, it's a pike. I'm like, I don't know if it's a pike, it's a big crappie. And it ended up being a crappie that exceeded 16 inches. But the head on that thing was out of this world. Oh, um, wow, that's was, awesome. And it's just little, little tiny pond. Like, it's silly. So, uh, you know, those are memories I can't. When it comes to fishing and you can just go into a place like that and it's just loaded with big fish, it's like a dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've developed such a passion for pan fish and crappie, like basin crappie in particular. It's it's so fun. Like, when you can, when you, can you know, drill and then get your flasher down and you just see, like, that cloud of fish just pull yeah. them up one after another and you're absolutely right about the about the biggest ones willing to uh willing to chase your jig a little bit farther so like that's it's such a good way to target the big the big ones out of that mm -hmm. yeah it was wild and that was fun because we got into that a couple times this year and that really helped i think we both crave insane fishing adventures that's why we love traveling for it and with the conditions this year obviously that wasn't possible so to be able to go to some kind of remote panfish areas and then target these big, you know, big crappie and 
that was that made the season. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. It, you still get your little <laughs> off the grid experience, and I'm I'm a hundred percent with you on being bummed that Canada's closed because like. Yeah. Um, last March I had a trip booked to Winnipeg to go after greenbacks and then it got postponed obviously until this year and now the borders closed again. So it's like, I've been itching for a year and a half to get up there and just can't do it, you know? And then, uh, you know, I've been up there once too, uh, in the, in the spring or like early, early summer did like a bear hunting walleye fishing combo trip. And it's just like, it's different up there. You go to a place where like the fish probably have never been graft before. You know, you're going out there with like little tiny boats and just find yourself a good spot. And like your jig won't even get to the bottom of the lake before you have one. It's just, it's, it's something to experience. It really is. It, it, it is. And so like not having that, I think been a bummer for so many Americans wanting to go North and, you know, chase that. But then you do have the chances. I think that's probably what this made me realize is how much good fishing we have here. If we just, you know, are forced to, you know, grind it out and try a bunch of different lakes and do your homework and put in the time, you know, versus always feeling like you want to travel to the next big lake, the next best thing up north. But there's a lot of great fishing here, especially for panfish, especially yeah. for crop. <laughs> oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. And, you know, I find that, you know, a lot of people say fishing isn't as good down here, but you don't necessarily put in as much time and effort. You know, like if you're going to do a destination trip, you're thinking about it, you're looking at maps and you're like literally fishing the entire day, you know? So like, you're obviously going to catch more fish if you're out there fishing the whole day versus like go to a lake cabin and you try it for an hour and like, ah, the fish aren't biting. So like, whatever, I'm going to go back to the cabin, you know, and just kind of give up on it. So you almost don't even give the area lakes around here a chance, but, um, you know, like right. you said, going to those remote sloughs or whatever and, and really getting after it, you could find yourself some some great fishing not very far away. It is, exactly. I mean, it is so much. It We just don't put in enough. We, we don't always put all of our energy into what's around us. And so that was what this year definitely taught me. And, uh, yeah, it worked out. It was, it was good. Super cool. All right, Emily, story time. Uh, you know the question I'm going to ask. It's, it's the buck behind you. <laughs> Can I ask Nicole a question really quick? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so, um, like, around here, the, the the lakes and stuff, I just feel like the fishing is just so limited around here. Um, you go to a lake, and you're going to be lucky that you even catch a fish. So that's why I really don't do much fishing around here. But I am like you. I love crappie fishing um, and trout fishing and stuff out west. Um, but I have to say crappie is my favorite fish to catch around here. So what's like the biggest crappie that you've been able to catch? Cause I'm, I love crappie. They're one of my favorite fish to fish for. <laughs> oh my goodness. Come fish with me, please. Um, <laughs> I <would anytime>. <laughs> uh, yeah. So like 16 inches, it was for length wise. I've caught a few that size. That is definitely my max right around the 16 inch mark. But what's really interesting about crappie here is depending on the body of water, um, their circumference is different and, and it's like they have different genetic variations. So some of the lakes we're on, they'll have these huge heads and they're like older fish or they have genetics for that. But then you go to like a red lake and you will get a 14 inch crappie, but it'll be so round and huge. It'll, it's like mind blowing because they have one, they're feeding on different food source, but two yeah. is they have a little different genetic strain. So Weight wise, I don't weigh them for conservation reasons and I like to throw them back, but length yeah. wise, 16 is the biggest huh. I've found. Now, do what you, about you? Do you usually oh, sorry. Catch, um, no, you're fine. Do you usually catch white crappie or black crappie or both? Or Here, black crappie, yeah, it's definitely um, yeah, much more prominent. So, pretty much all the crappie fishing I do is black crappie. What about okay. you guys? Well, I feel like here, most of the ones that I've caught have actually been white crappie. Like, I feel like I hardly catch any black ones. So it must be kind of the opposite then. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I would love to get into a, a white crappie bite. And I know there's places in North Dakota, South Dakota that have that or Northern South Dakota, but I don't typically <laughs> catch them. So, and yeah. our waters are very dominant black crappie. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, same here. I mean, yeah, we're, we're fishing a lot of the same areas. So, I mean, I, I don't even know if I've caught a white crappie, to be honest with you. I've been just pretty much yeah, just fishing white, for black crappies. The white crappie here are, the white crappie here are bigger than black crappie. Is that probably the same case there if you do catch a white crappie or they're probably yeah, bigger than blacks or? 
Yeah, I, I definitely, I'm not a white crappie expert by any means, but they definitely seem to run bigger. They're a yeah. bigger strain. So I would love to catch some more, but they're just not prominent. So I mean, if you have some great white crappie lakes over there, sign me up. <laughs> yeah, come on over. <laughs> yeah, you pick the spot, Nicole will show you how to catch them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that sounds like some pretty good teamwork there. I see a, I see a DSG photo shoot in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I fish, but nothing to her level. I'm more into the bow hunting, but I do love fishing, though. <laughs> That's awesome. And I can say the same. Like, I fish way more than I hunt, but I love hunting. I'm just, I'm not great. When you talk about killing all these things with your bow, like, I can't hit the broadside of a barn half the time when something <laughs> walks in front of me. So <laughs> I hey, try so hard. We can't all be good at everything, so. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and here you girls are catching 16-inch crappies and shooting 190-inch whitetails, so I'm just going to kind of stay quiet here. Oh, yeah. No, in, enjoying it. Being out there is what's most important, not that 190-inch deer on the wall behind you. <laughs> So, yeah, that doesn't <laughs> yeah, let's let's hear the story on it, though. I'm I'm really curious about that. OK, so the story can be very long, but I'll try to put it short. That way I don't take everybody's time up with it. Um, but first of all, I named this buck the freak. And if you can see, he's got some pretty crazy brow tines and stuff going on. Um, I originally called him the freak because we're kind of thinking that he got hit by a car, possibly from what I could see from looking at him. So I've had several I've had, I actually, after I killed the deer, I thought maybe I only had four or five years of history with them. But looking back through trail camera photos, because I keep folders of trail camera photos, like from 2010 forward. So when I was looking back into photos of 2012, I actually have pictures of this deer as a two-year-old in 2012. That's how long this deer has been around. Um, but anyways, he, he sustained some sort of, we're thinking, got hit by a car or something back in 2018. And he just, he didn't look very good. His hip was all screwed up. And he had one big, crazy, abnormal side. And then the other side, which I thought was abnormal, but come to find out, he completely broke his beam off, like right after the brow tine. So he had this huge, big fork brow tine, and then this weird... I don't even know what he had going on the other side. So that's where he got the name the freak from. Never once put two and two together that this was a deer that I've had pictures of previously or what he would turn into. Um, so didn't really think anything about him. The next year I was, you know, trying to do some deer photography in an alfalfa field where, you know, I hunted on the lower end where I got pictures of him the year before. And this buck stepped out into the field and I literally about died. Like I could not believe the size of this deer. And I knew exactly what deer it was because he carried a huge, crazy, abnormal side. But then he had his huge normal side. And then you can see what caliber of deer it was. And I was just blown away because I had never laid eyes on a deer of this caliber, let alone be 60, 70, 80 yards from him with a photography camera in the middle of a field, and he had no care in the world that I was there. So I took tons of photography of him, and I'm like, I have got to try to kill this deer. And this was in 2019 season. Well, unfortunately for me, I wasn't able to hunt the upper end of the farm where he spent most of his time. I was only able to hunt the lower end. And unfortunately, as hard as I tried, he never would show up at the lower end. So 2019 season came and went and I'm like, you know, I don't even know if the deer is alive. I don't know, you know, nobody's gonna talk about a deer of that caliber if they do see it. Um, so it was right after bow season, like a week or two after bow season, I got trail camera pictures of this deer finally on the lower end of the farm after not seeing him since August, the previous year. And he had already shed one, one side. He shed his abnormal side and I couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to find the shed off this deer. So lo and behold, he shed his, his big normal side, which if you can see back here, it's laying on top of my pedestal, that shed. And, um, 
So I was like, you know, I don't really know much about where the deer's staying, but I know he liked to hang out at the upper end more. So the first place I looked was the exact fence crossing where I photographed him coming into the alfalfa field the previous year and laying on the other side of that fence, lo and behold, was that antler. And I couldn't believe it. One of the biggest antlers I'd ever found, it was 81 and 6 eighths inches. Um, so then, you know, my passion grew more and more for this whitetail because he made it through. And I'm like, what is this deer going to turn into the next year? You know, I didn't really know how old he was because I just didn't put all the information together at that time. So 2020 season rolls around and I was able to gain access to hunt the upper end of the farm now. So it was game on. I spent all summer, I had cameras completely covering the whole end of that farm. I've created mock scrape lines. I had trail cameras on trails, creek crossings, fence crossings, anywhere that I thought that this buck would possibly show. I wanted to try to figure out how to kill this deer somehow because he was such a hard deer to figure out. Um, you know, summer came and went and never had any sightings of him in velvet like I did the previous year. So finally, um, we had like a red moon week, um, beginning of October, and I got a photo of him on a trail camera over one of my mock scrapes I created. And let me tell you, when I got to, when I checked my trail camera and I'm scrolling through the photos and that deer showed up on the trail camera, I immediately kid you not, almost threw up because I could not <laughs> believe what my eyes were looking at. I mean, he looked like an elk rack on a white tail body and I was just blown away. Like I couldn't even sleep for the next few days. I'm like, you know, I finally got a picture of this deer, but I know I'm not going to be able to kill him on this mock scrape line because a deer that caliber is not going to be dumb and walk out in the middle of a wide open hay field in broad daylight to hit a mock scrape. Mm -hmm. So um, I ended, I had a trail camera on that same fence crossing where he crossed in 2019, where I found his shed February of 2020. And, you know, it's, it's, Bow season's already started. I haven't even hung a stand yet because I didn't know where I wanted to, you know, try to hunt this deer at. So, you know, I was so excited seeing that trail camera photo. I never even checked the fence crossing camera. Well, that was a bad decision because later on that, I think it was that Saturday, if I checked it Wednesday, had the photo of him on the mock scrape, that Saturday I went back and checked the um, fence crossing camera and he was at that fence crossing every day during the red moon that week and three days in the daylight. And I did not even check it until that Saturday. Oh, so Saturday, ouch. <laughs> so Saturday night was the last day of the red moon. And I'm a complete believer in the red moon. I followed it to a T and the red moon is what got me this giant behind me. Um, so it was the last night of the red moon. We had a front coming in um, with some rain and stuff that night coming into Sunday. So, you know, I call one of my good buddies. I'm telling him all about this. And he's like, you have got to hang a stand now. And you have got to get in there and hunt. And I'm like, I don't even know how I'm going to accomplish this because, you know, it's one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. I haven't even eaten lunch. I just got off work. How in the world am I going to hang a stand and kill this deer tonight? But I did it. I did it, and I couldn't believe that I did it. I packed a stand, had all my hunting clothes, my gear, my bow, and I carried it all in, packed it all in. I hung this tree stand in a huge salt timber-sized shag bark hickory tree. If you can only imagine how difficult it was to hang a stand in a shag bark hickory tree it was impossible and the tree was so big i couldn't even get a strap around it i had to double strap a strap in order to get the first stick on the tree and i didn't even think i was going to be able to get i got partly partially the way up and i'm like there's no way i'm going to do this like i am like bleeding from the bark i'm sweating you know it was an absolute nightmare but i finally made it to the top my tree stand was crooked because the tree split and there was no way to get the stand level. And I'm like, there, there's no other way to do anything here. So I just pulled my bow up and I was only like 15 feet off the ground. You know, I hate being that low in a stand. But I was like, you know what? We'll just give her a whirl. Thank goodness it started raining. That actually kind of 
helped a lot of the scent and stuff that I made putting the stand up. But, you know, I was sweating a bunch and I made so much noise with the climbing sticks. I was like, there's no way anything is going to come in. So we had the rain. It was a little bit after six. And I look up through the hollow and all I could see was antlers sticking out of this side of the tree and antlers sticking out on that side of the tree. And I'm like, there's only one buck on this property that has a rack that wide and it is the freak. And lo and behold, he is coming straight at me a little after six. And I am just in complete disbelief that this is really happening. And so I stand up and then I realize that if he goes up to the fence crossing and cross out into the field, I'm not going to be able to get a shot. And that's what he always did. So I was in a panic. But some for some reason, he decided to go down to the right below me, acting like he was going to, he must have been feeding on the oaks and the big oak tree behind me. And he ended up walking down that way and literally stopped perfectly broadside at 18 yards and for some reason just turned his head back to the other way which felt like five minutes so I was able to draw back he never knew I was there the wind was right I was able to take my time release the arrow and completely pinwheeled him at 18 yards and a hurting crash just over the bank probably maybe 50 60 yards away and I mean I have to say that I usually get buck fever, but with this deer, I was the most calm I have ever been with shooting a whitetail before. And, but after I released that arrow, I lost it. I was bawling my eyes out. I couldn't keep my composure. I was shaking. I was about to fall out of the tree. I'm calling everybody that I know on the phone and they are just in complete disbelief that I just shot that deer. And I mean, how everything worked out was just, it was just all like it was meant to be, you know, from hanging the stand about killing myself and, you know, how the wind was, how the weather was, the path that he took, how he stopped and turned, like everything was just perfect and how, you know, it was really meant to be. So it's just like, I don't think I will ever have another hunt as crazy and as perfect as that one was, to be honest. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Yeah, that's going to be a tough one to top. That's just, (laughs) and you earned that one too. Like, I, I, yeah, I hadn't heard the story at all before, so I was super curious about it. But like yeah. to to photograph him, to have years of sheds, to have and to hang a stand that day, like after work, it's yep, that's By awesome. Myself and lug everything in, and I mean, I don't know if you can tell my size, but I'm like 110 pounds soaking wet. So for me to accomplish all that by myself was a pretty big deal. <laughs> mm-hmm, for sure. Wow. Kudos to you on that one. <laughs> Thanks. So how did you, what made you not have buck fever? Because I just lose my mind when I see big deer. I don't know how you managed I, to shoot that. <laughs> honestly, I don't know. I think it's because I was so focused and so determined that I there was, I had to accomplish this. There was no time to get nervous. There was no time for my mind to be wandering. It's like, this is a now or never. And if I don't make it happen, I'm never going to get this opportunity again. So I think I was just so into the zone with it that everything else just completely left my mind. And I was just a hundred percent focused and calm. Like, I don't know if we'll ever be able to do that again, but with that deer and messages, because I just knew that I had to be, or I would screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And how much practice do you think? Like, do you, I'm assuming you practice throughout shooting throughout the entire year religiously. And that must just finally pay off when instincts kick in and you see something like that. Yeah. So this past season, I actually practiced the most um, with my bow more than I usually do just because I had that out West hunt. So, you know, I was practicing 60 yards constantly. Um, but then once the out West trip was over, I backed it down to 40 and I never shot any closer than 40. So I kept it in 40 and, you know, I kept pinwheeling the target at 40 to where most of my shots around here are going to be 25 yards or less because there's so much, you know, so much trees and brush and stuff, you're not gonna be able to shoot that far. So, I mean, when he was that close, I mean, it was like a chip shot compared to, you know, target practicing. So that's why I like to do, you know, to practice at farther distances. So then when something's up close then you can really make a good shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, that's a great tip is just to, to practice shooting at longer distances than what 
you know, you feel comfortable in the field and what you expect to shoot. Because, yeah, like you said, if you're dialed out at 60, that 25-yard shot's going to seem like a breeze. Yep, exactly. So, it, I mean, it really paid off. It really boosted my my confidence level. And, you know, I struggle a lot with target panic and stuff, too. So, long, you know, the more long distance you shoot and the more comfortable you can get with long distance, then I feel like you just get more comfortable in general, you know, shooting a bow and shooting at a target and then especially at an animal. Mm -hmm, for sure. Great tip. So uh, I'd like to move into just kind of a little tip section here. So um, we'll start out uh, sheds. I see that shed down there behind you. What are, what are some advice you have for shed hunting, Emily? So, you know, shed hunting, I've, you know, shed hunting is something that I've always done when I was little. When I was younger, I had really no clue what I was doing, no science behind it. I just walked around the woods and I thought you could find a shed. I mean, in some cases, you can just walk around the woods and find a shed, but there is a little bit of science behind it. You know, you kind of have to think like a big buck and you have to learn, you know, what, you know, bucks are going to do in the wintertime, you know, shed hunting the food sources your bedding areas, your travel corridors, corridors to and from food. Um, a lot of good places I like to look is honeysuckle, especially when there's no, you have a harsh winter with a lot of snow. Honeysuckle is the only thing that's green. So deer love to feed on honeysuckle because it does stay green and it's sweet throughout the winter. Fence crossings, creek crossings, anything that's going to jolt their antlers and stuff off is good places to look. Like where I found the big shed behind me was at a fence crossing. Um, and also, you know, big buck bedding points, you know, bucks like to bed where they can see everything out in front of them and they can smell what's coming in, you know, from behind them. So, you know, good little points and stuff where you feel like a buck would feel most comfortable because he can smell or see a predator when they're coming are really great places to look for sheds as well. Okay. So big buck bedding area. Um, can you go through that again? Like, uh, I, I understand bedding areas, but like how to determine a regular bedding area versus something that would be good for a big buck. So, you know, there's lots deer bed in all, you know, sorts of places and stuff. Bedding areas are going to be, you know, your thicker areas, your, your brusher, brushier areas, any place where the deer is going to feel, you know, maybe a little more warmth, like in pines or in cedars and stuff in the winter time. Um, big bucks really like to, the main reason for a big buck is, you know, for food and survival. So, you know, when a big buck beds, he wants to bed somewhere where, you know, he feels at, that he has the advantage. So any places where, you know, it's like ridge, ridge points or any little funnel points, um, and, and fingers and stuff where he can bed on a point and he can see down below him like in in a bottom or down below him over a ridge or out into a field or something and then when the wind is actually coming to his back that way you know he can watch but then he can smell if something's coming behind him so he has the advantage at all times um and also you know south or southwest facing slopes in the winter are going to be warmer when the sun is shining so you know, bucks and just any bucks or deer in general will really like to bed on those warm, sunny facing slopes in the winter where they're going to get some heat and stuff from the sun. So those are really good places to find sheds off big bucks too. Okay. Very cool. Find, find those big buck areas, find the places where they're going to feed and crisscross in between. Yep. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just got to think like a big buck. <laughs> yep. There you go. I like that. <laughs> uh, okay. Fishing question. Uh, you're excited for headed to the rainy. How do you, how do you target big walleyes in this, this upcoming season? What's your advice? Uh, so this time of year is like some of the best when we're coming into some of the easiest trophy fishing, um, just because when fish start their spawning patterns and pre-spawn patterns, like going to a river, all these big fish are like funneling in one area. So the work is getting so much easier, right? Like, Midsummer, a lot of times, like on Lake of the Woods and stuff, sure, you can find them in deep flats, but they're scattered up, scattered about, or on a lot of lakes, they sit down by the thermocline. And so this time of year is the one time of year where they like this and during the fall shine a run, where they congregate into a river and all you got to do is set up in a few of the right places, you know, like they're stuck on distance, they're stuck on depth. 
And so you just, you know, it doesn't mean the fish are always going to bite, but if the timing's right, it's the easiest fishing you'll get. And so when you're fishing rivers, um, me and my husband, we, and me and my girlfriends, like we just use bigger jigs because you're fighting that current. You can use shine, you know, we'll use dead or live shiners or we'll use plastics and just drag them on the bottom, pitch them really simple fishing, uh, for bodies of water like rainy river, where there's such a big, I don't know, there's just so many of them, the density is so high. And if you've been there, there's a million boats. So it's just a matter of getting out there early and putting in your time and, you know, trying to find any little different, you know, just get right off the current seam and try some of that, try an inlet, um, try like a little bit of a bowl off the edge of a bend. Like those are just little areas that fish can sometimes congregate where I've personally found a lot of my best fish. And that's, yeah, that is that simple. Um, and I think you'll find that in most rivers I also like to target little rivers. So we think like rain, we think of rainy and we think of the Missouri and stuff, um, Mississippi for big walleye right now. But I also like just fishing small rivers this, as we go into May and April where it's open and into Minnesota around the middle of May when it opens up because a lot of times those walleye will be up there too. So even if you live in like a area where you're not next to, you know, giant fishery, but you have these little streams, you'll find walleye up in different areas like in any little bowl, in any creek coming in, like they congregate and it's it's really easy fishing for anybody, you know, depending on where you're at and when it opens, um, it's great fishing. And, you know, from middle of May, as long as you're around the spawn and then the border waters right now in North Dakota where it never closes and they're already starting that pattern. Does that, does that help? I don't know. <laughs> That's a lot of words. It, yeah, it definitely helps. So it's, you gotta get out there, number one. There's a, lot, there. there's a lot of nice yeah. fish starting to congregate um so you you have success you just like pitch jigs and you use like plastics or shiners yeah i use both you know we use a lot of live bait in the fall but we use a lot of plastics too and we use a lot of plastics now in the spring just river it's pretty classic river fishing heavier jigs just to make sure that you're at least bouncing the bottom or dragging the bottom um really simple fishing i that's why i, lo I love it because it's easy and it has a high return rate um so yeah, and then like for walleye fishing, and then I think something a lot of people maybe don't do enough of that's really simple is pan fishing. Cause as we go, it never closes in Minnesota. And as we go in later in the season, they push into the shallows and the bites out of control. You can just pitch into a foot of weeds and with a bobber, literally like one to two feet of water with a bobber and some a half of a worm. And you're just gonna have a heyday in a lot of these places. So like, this is the best time of year, this and then October, like November is the best time to be on the water. Mm -hmm, for sure. I was just gonna ask you, do you ever try to fly fish for pan fish? Never have. You never have. The only way I fish for pan fish here in Ohio now is by fly rod. And it is so much fun. You'll have to try it. <laughs> <laughs> I need to try it. That sounds amazing. Oh my yeah, goodness. It is a lot. It is a lot of fun. Yeah. I think it's a lot more fun than just fishing like with a bobber and stuff too. It's just something different, I guess. And I really enjoy it. So I think you would find it really fascinating too. <laughs> oh, I think I would love it. I love it. I love that type of stuff. And it's a challenge and that'd be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah. something I'd love to try too. I've never tried fly fishing. Like we had a, we had a podcast with, uh, Chris Pyra, who is in Colorado Springs, works there, and he talked about basically fly fishing 101, how to do it. And I was like, I really need to pick myself up a fly rod because I want to try smallmouth bass in the rivers here, and I want to try panfish because, like, we'll go out and we'll catch panfish in, like you said, one, two, three feet of water. But, like, to do it on a fly rod, that'd be super cool. It, it's oh, so much fun. It's something completely different to do. <clears throat> All right. Next question. We're going to talk Turkey. Um, Emily, what are, what are some of your best Turkey tips for the upcoming season? Okay. So the Turkey tips that I will give pertains a lot to bow hunting, but also to anybody that's want to pursue a bird with a gun as well. So after all the years that I've tried to harvest one with a bow, um, some of the best tips that I have for Turkey, trying to harvest a Turkey with your bow, um, for one is practice shooting your bow from a sitting position because when you're going to be shooting a bird you're going to be sitting you're not going to be standing so i can't stress enough to practice in the sitting position and even get you know a turkey target in practice you know shooting at an actual turkey target 
um, and learn your different shot placements and stuff that you need to actually kill the bird because their kill zone is so small. Um, but actually going into the turkey hunt, you know, I use ground blinds anytime I'm, you know, bow hunting for turkey. It just makes it a lot easier to wear. Turkey has such a keen eyesight, so any little bit of movement, they're going to spot. So when you're in a ground blind, especially if you wear black, when you're in a ground blind, you can move around and draw back. They're not going to pick you out as if you were out in the open. Um, the decoy setup that I think works best um, all year round, I use it all year round and I have luck, but especially in the beginning of season, I usually run a half strut Jake decoy over a lay down hen. And then I usually will have like a feeding hen or something close by to, to where it looks more natural. You know, a gobbler feels more comfortable coming out to an open field when he sees a feeding hen or several Turkey, instead of just, you know, one bird in the field, he'll feel more comfortable with that. And then normally if you have any sort of Jake decoy or a half strut Jake decoy and a gobbler sees that, especially when there's a hen nearby, they will literally run right at you. And I mean, it happens so fast, especially on your ground line. You really have to pay attention because all of a sudden it's going to be like, bam, there's a gobbler right in front of you. But he means business and he wants to kick that Jake's butt. So um, they'll come in and they'll jump all over that Jake. They'll be in full strut. They'll be pecking at it. They'll be spinning around it to where... You have, a, you have a good amount of time and they're so occupied to be able to draw your bow back and actually take your time and make a shot. So that's why I love using the Jake decoy because the gobblers are so focused on beating the Jake up that they kind of forget what's going on around them. Um, another tip that I have is, you know, being patient is number one for turkey hunting. You know, a lot of people... And it, it's the same for any sort of hunting, elk hunting, anything like that, especially so with, with turkey, when you go out, a lot of people, if they don't hear a bird, they're just like, oh, there's no birds here. You know, they quit, they go home, they move to a different area. Well, I've learned over the years um, by running trail cameras all spring, I will actually figure out where gobblers and hens spend most of their time. So, you know, whether it's any time in the morning or later in the morning or afternoon. So I figure out where they like to hang out, where gobblers feel comfortable hanging out, where they feel comfortable, you know, strutting in a certain strut zone or feeding in a certain field. And I like to set up in those areas. And honestly, most of the time that I go out, I will be lucky if I even hear a gobble because we don't have a huge bird population here. So it's not uncommon for me to not even hear a gobble. So, you know, I sit there and I'm patient and I usually just do um, a calling sequence about every 15 minutes. Um, I switch up calls to where it sounds like there's different birds. I like to, you know, move around in the blind, facing the call at different angles to where it sounds like the hen is moving. That way, you know, the gobbler doesn't think it's just, you know, because gobblers are smart. If you don't move and you keep calling, they're not going to come to you because they know that you're not legit. So if you really kind of change it up with your calling and, you know, move your call in different angles and stuff where it sounds like you're moving, um, it'll, you know, spike a gobbler's interest a little bit more. So like I said, I do the calling sequence about every 15 minutes. And at some point in time in the morning, whether I ever hear a bird or not, I usually eventually have a gobbler make his way in to finally, you know, check me out. Because gobblers will usually hang out with the hens in the morning. Later on in the morning, the hens will kind of disperse and go to nest or do their own thing. And the gobbler will actually start to walk around and look for another hen. So as long as you keep doing a calling sequence and moving around, a gobbler will more than likely come and check you out later in the morning. So, and most of the time they come in silent. I mean, Sometimes you can be in areas where a gobbler's just hammering, 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 and he'll come right to you and make noise the whole time. But around here, there's a lot of predator pressure, so they don't talk much. So, you know, a lot of times they come in silent. So you just got to be ready, be prepared, and expect, you know, expect them to come in silent and then later in the morning. So I've honestly, I've had most of my success between about 8 o'clock and 9.30 in the morning. In, in the way of killing gobblers. So I don't know. Those are kind of some of the best tips that I have for people. That was an awesome answer. 
Like I asked just <laughs> a broad question and you rattled off on like on on. eight really good tips there. I was like, oh, I could interject there, but you pretty much just <laughs> summed it right up. I love it. So yeah. making my job here super easy. <laughs> I was trying to take notes. <laughs> yeah. You know, the beauty about this is it's recorded. So now we're just after this podcast drops, we can go and we can listen to that segment, listen to it again. And it's like, okay, now I know how to kill a turkey. Yeah. You know, com- awesome. combine, awesome. yeah, combine that with the, uh, with the calling segment we did a, we did a week or two back and you're, you're literally set in the turkey woods. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, I've, I mean, I've turkey hunted for years by myself. So I have learned a lot of things through trial and error and especially, you know, hunting the same area year after year after year, you kind of figure out, you Mm -hmm. know, how the gobblers react, you know, what they like, what they don't like, how they move, you know, kind of areas that they like better than others. And then you really start to figure out and you can have a lot more success by figuring all that out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can you can learn about everything on YouTube and through podcasts and whatnot, but there's no substitute for actually getting out in the field and experiencing it yourself. And you're you're gonna fail at times. You absolutely are. Everybody does. But you know those times where everything comes together, you get that you get that uh, Tom coming in that sees your half strut Jake and is like, "I'm bigger than that guy. I'm gonna <laughs> kick his butt and I'm gonna take his girl." And then all of a sudden, he's right in your lap. Oh, it's yeah. so fun. I just, I can't wait for turkey season. Yeah. Yeah. Last year, last year, um, I was, you know, just kind of hanging out and about at eight twenty, and all of a sudden I look over and there was a gobbler beelining it to the, right straight at me. And I didn't even have my bow picked up and I had to get my bow picked up. And I mean, he was there and I hadn't even got my bow up off the ground yet. I mean, and that, that Jake decoy saved me because I had to do so much moving and then draw back and everything. And he never spotted me. And that's another thing too, is probably people wonder, you know, how far do you place your decoys away from your ground blind when you're bow hunting? I mean, when you're gun hunting, you obviously want to place them out farther because there's such good, you know, patterns to these new, you know, turkey loads that if you put anything too close, you're going to miss them because the pattern is so tight. So normally when I'm gun hunting, I put the decoys out like 30 yards or so. That way you can get a good pattern. But with bow hunting, I like to set the decoys at 10 yards. That way they are right on top of you. And when I practice from the chair, I usually practice at that 10 yard range as well. So you're comfortable at, you know, knowing where you need to put your pin at that close a distance to make a good shot. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Cause if they make it to that 10 yard range, like they're going to be focused on that decoy and that's going to give you time to draw back and whatnot. But if they hang up, you know, if you place your decoy out at 30 yards, then that bird's hanging up at 60, 70, you're not going to get that shot. But, you know, if you place your decoys at 10 and then they hang up, then they're going to be at like 30. And then, you know, you're still on the chips there. Yep. Yep. You still have a, you still have a good, you know, shot, you know, chance and stuff there. I mean, it'll be, you know, that kill zone is a little bit harder to hit out there 30, 40 yards or so, but it's definitely still doable. (laughs) Mm -hmm. For sure. So, okay. Question for you, Nicole. How did you get hooked up with DSG and what is your, what is your favorite gear in the lineup? What do you, what can you not leave without? Um, so DSG was when I first started the social media thing, DSG was the first company actually to reach out on the hunting side. Cause I, I hunt a lot, not a great hunter. I'm taking a lot of notes, Emily, but <laughs> uh, that was where I started and it was, you know, it was great. They, they're an amazing company and, I worked with them a couple of years there and the fishing stuff really took off for me because I just do it so much. And I had some other offers come up and some other opportunities that I obviously took along the way and um, kind of pulled me away from DSG a little bit because there's always conflicts of interest and stuff like that with those types of partnerships. And then um, DSG went really big in the fishing world this last two years, really. And they came back and they're like, we, you know, we love you. Let's make this work. We, you know, we all have a great partnership going forward and it's been fantastic. So I was happy that, you know, DSG is like kind of like that home for me where they were the first brand that really was like, oh, we just want to partner with you and see what we can do. And that's kind of, you know, this much farther along, that's where I am. And it's great. 
Um, my favorite thing from their lineup is the ice suit. This last year, that suit was incredible. It definitely changed the game for women ice fishing. It's really, really uh, warm, um, but it's also really, you can move. So, I mean, not only is it a good looking suit, but it was a suit that we I could finally run around in and jump holes and all that. And it, I wasn't like Oompa Loompa out there. And a lot of girls felt that way. <laughs> and so, you know, like it helps you stay warmer when you can move. And now they are dropping a rain suit this season. So that might rival it. I'm putting the rain suit to the test in the next couple of weeks. So that might be my next favorite. Very cool. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm not doing podcasts here, like my, my main job with shields is, uh, is the social media realm of things. So I'm, you know, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, you know, answering comments and stuff like that. And a lot of stuff in like, and female clothing is like none of it fits why don't we have stuff specific for females and it's like dsg has got you covered like dsg is literally making my job easier when people say they need something to uh, you know that fits them better you know like look at their line they put out some great stuff oh it's fantastic and i mean all they do is women's apparel so when that is all you do like you do it really well because that's they're focusing on all of us you know and it's hard for a lot of brands to focus on women's apparel when they have men's apparel and rods and lures and all that, you know, on the fishing side. And so to, for them to just come in on hunting, fishing, snowmobiling, ice, they can really own it and it shows. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. So uh, same, same question for you, Emily, how did you get uh, connected with DSG and what's your, what's your favorite stuff in the lineup? So um, funny story is um, I'm just, like I'm a, such a passionate bow hunter. And honestly, I think sometimes I take bow hunting more serious than most men do. <laughs> so for me, I am really, really hardcore into finding clothing that is going to work for me. So I am extremely tiny. So ever since I was little, I have struggled with finding clothes that fit me. You know, I started out, I had to wear youth like large and extra large clothing forever because they never even made women clothing and stuff. Um, and then I would wear like men's smalls. And then, you know, there's so many other, you know, hunting companies that make women's clothing, but it's not a priority. So they might only have one suit or one outfit or something for early season or something for late season. So they just don't have the whole entire package. So after years and years and years of being frustrated with wearing multiple different types of stuff, wearing men's, wearing youth, um, you know, since I really got involved on Instagram, I became a lot of really good friends with a lot of the women and the girls and stuff with DSG. So, and I've known a lot of them, you know, for a few years. And so I finally started talking with them and complaining about, you know, all the issues that I'm having. I can't find gear and this and that and the other. And so they're like, yeah, we're the same way. So they kind of literally just scooped me up and they said, okay, come and join us with DSG because our whole goal, you know, is to design women's clothing, whether it's for fishing or for hunting, that is strictly for females, puts all the priority on females. So that's kind of how I got started with that was they just kind of scooped me up because I just have had so many issues with every other clothing, you know, company and finding things that fit me. So DSG actually has such a wide variety of sizing that people that are extra, extra small like me all the way to plus size can actually wear functional, you know, flattering, comfortable clothing to wear hunting now. So it's just been a huge game changer for me. Um, and I have to say, probably it's hard for me to just pick one outfit that I really like. <laughs> so, you know, I'll probably pick a couple things that I really like. But I think one of my favorite, you know, outfits is the Brianna Fleece Pullover. Um, absolutely love it because it's dead quiet and it is super warm. So I have a really hard time of staying warm in the tree stand. And honestly, I really haven't found anything that has been as warm is that brand of fleece pullover and it's dead quiet and i absolutely love it for late season and then they now have a bib that goes with it the same material that's super extremely warm so that's probably one of my favorite sets if not that um you know some of their mid their mid-season sets i absolutely love them too 
like the Ava and stuff, they're they're so comfortable and they're good for those mid season temperatures and stuff. So those are probably probably a couple of my favorite. Very cool. Okay, this question goes out to uh, to both of you. So, what would you say to people that are interested in getting into the outdoors, whether it be hunting and fishing, you know, this, this kind of COVID time period got people, you know, interested in, in doing things that they haven't really done for a long time or want to start. So um, men, women, kids, anybody interested in, in getting into it, what's your advice? And then just, just take it. Both you gals are super passionate. So if you go down rabbit holes, totally fine. I'll, I'll let Nicole start first. <laughs> um, so, you know, just go out, just start somewhere. I mean, I think a lot of people want to get into fishing and hunting both, but they think they need to go out and have like everything or have all this fancy gear when really the best thing you can do is find someone else that, you know, maybe knows what they're doing go out with them, learn a little bit and then just try it yourself. And you don't, you know, you can shore fish. Um, you can take kayaks like that's super common now. You don't need a $50,000 boat to learn how to fish. You just need to be able to be near water and put in some time. And like with the internet, everything you need is accessible to you. You just have to go out and practice it. And I think that's what a lot of people are just kind of nervous about learning or where to start um, because they've never done it before. And all I say is like either go with somebody or do a quick Google search, watch a quick YouTube video. You can go find a rod at shields for $50 and go try it. You know, they can, you, someone will literally walk you through how to set it up and you can just go out there and, you know, try to find a little structure or if you're river fishing, try to fish a little hole or under a tree and see, see what happens and then take notes and go from there. Like I just, nothing, nothing replaces just trying. And we have all the information you need now with social media and the internet. And I think, you know, I'll speak for both Emily and me. We love talking to new people online. So like if anyone ever reaches out, reaches out to us, like we will help you any way we possibly can with, you know, our experience. Yep. Yep. A hundred percent on that. And I actually, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of females reach out to me all the time, you know, asking tips or asking things about the apparel or, you know, just things on shed hunting or turkey hunting or bow hunting, or how do you even get into it? So, you know, it kind of makes me feel good for people to ask me those questions because I feel like I'm doing something right if somebody wants to look up to me and ask me those things. So, you know, if anybody has any questions, I'm sure you're just like me. I enjoy teaching people. I enjoy teaching kids things in the outdoors. You know, it's just so satisfying doing that. Um, and pretty much like she said, like, if you want to get involved in it, it's best to find a family member or a friend or, you know, anybody that you might know that, you know, fishes or hunts and then just say, hey, I want to go, you know, along with you and try it out. You know, I have a lot of females. I've had a couple girls this year that actually has gone shed hunting with me for the first time. And they're like, you know, I've never, don't really have much experience with shed hunting. I just really want to get out in the woods, get out of the house and go and maybe learn a few things. And, you know, they've absolutely loved it, even though they haven't done it before, whether they found a shed or not, but to just get out there and, you know, learn something from a fellow, you know, friend or a female has made like a big difference. So, you know, just getting to know people that do it and just go with them and learn it and try it. And, you know, maybe they'll even let you, you know, take over, you know, a gun one season and they'll take you hunting and you can pull the trigger or, you know, hand over their rod and you can reel in a fish, you know, anything like that, but just to get started somewhere. And then like, you know, Nicole said with YouTube videos and everything on the internet and following people on social media, there's tons of ways to learn things in hunting nowadays. Like back when I started, I mean, I felt like you wanted to learn how to hunt. There was no resources out there. You had to know somebody or have a family member to take you. But nowadays, there's so many resources. It makes that a lot easier. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, love the information. Uh, it's it's been a great segment. I've I've learned quite a bit, and it's just it's been great. So. Um, for people that wanna that wanna follow you, gals, wanna stay connected. How do how do people find you? You know your social media platforms, things like that. Go ahead, Nicole. 
Um, so you guys can follow me, Nicole Stone Outdoors, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Um, and then I also have a website, NicoleStoneOutdoors.com, where I drop tips all the time. You know, so if you're Googling something or you just you want to know a tip or a trick or how to go spring coffee fishing, I usually have an editorial on there um, with a lot of information to help people out. So I don't have as many things as, as Nicole does, <laughs> but I do have Instagram and Facebook. So you can find me um, at Shad Emily. It's pretty simple. Um, and then and then Emily Shad, obviously, on Facebook. But, you know, I just I mainly like to do a lot of a lot of helpful tips and, you know, story like posts and do a lot of, you know, photography. I really enjoy photography. So if you like, you know, photography and stuff and want to learn some things, I mean, I do share a lot of cool stuff on, on Instagram that you could learn from. Mm -hmm. And I also, you know, if you ever want to, for a lot of people that don't know, you know, I do um, article writing um, and stuff for like Peterson bow hunting. So, you know, if you ever want to read any articles or have any, you know, want to learn any tips and stuff from there. I do do article writing and stuff for them as well. Very cool. Very cool. And then both of you are fairly active in the, on the DSG platforms too, right? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So yeah. And I know anybody from DSG, like we're all, all about sharing and helping and not only helping the ladies find the right gear or the men find their ladies the right gear, but also like the tips and stuff like that. So I hope everyone knows they can reach out to anyone on DSG and we're happy to yep. help you out. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I'm pretty sure everybody's willing to help and stuff out on the DSG team and everybody's really knowledgeable. You know, all the women are very knowledgeable with hunting, with fishing. I mean, they all know their stuff and they know their gear, what works for them and what doesn't work for them. So everybody is great to ask questions on there. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, Emily and Nicole, for your time, uh, your advice. Uh, it's just, it's great to see you gals being an inspiration to everyone out there, you know, helping, helping people find the right lines of products and tips and tricks. It's just, it's, it's really cool to see what you gals are doing out there. Thank you. Yeah. So. Yeah, thank you for having us, for sure. <laughs> we enjoy every minute of it. <laughs> yeah, same here. All right, well, best of luck with your with your upcoming seasons. You too. Yeah, you. you too. All right, thank you. You just heard our segment with DSG Ambassadors Emily Shad and Nicole Stone. If you like what you heard in this segment, please give us a follow on the listening platform you chose today and get ready for what we have coming up next. We have an exciting event coming to you from Shields, and that is the Spring Virtual Hunt Series, happening March 30th through April 1st. At 7 p.m. Central Standard Time each night, we're gonna be giving away prize packages totaling $7,500 and hosting live virtual seminars on turkey hunting, land management, and trap shooting with Scott Ellis, Mike Pentecost, Michael Waddell, and two-time Olympic champion Vincent Hancock. You'll have an opportunity to ask these guys questions to get yourself ready for the upcoming seasons or get all the information you need to start up a new hobby. Register for free by heading to shields.com slash hunt series or by clicking the link in the description. And with that, we want to thank you all for listening and see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Shields Outdoors podcast. Stay tuned for future segments and visit our social media pages, Shields Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram for daily updates.